Hello and welcome to this session of Talking Tech, Women and Girls in ICT. My name is Amina. And today I am delighted to be having a discussion about tech and tech careers with Dr. Kim Malali, senior, senior lecturer and leader of the communication and system group in the Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of the West Indies at St. Augustine in Trinidad and Tobago. Talking Tech is a series celebrating girls and women in tech. It's being recorded around the world between Girls in ICT Day 2020 and Girls in ICT Day 2022. Girls in ICT Day is an international day marked on the fourth Thursday of each April. The objective is to help create a global environment that encourages young women to consider studies and careers in the field of ICT. The Talking Tech series is brought to you by the ITU UNICC and the Office of the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth and is supported and is in support of EQUALS, the Global Partnership for Gender Equality in the Digital Age. Hi, Kim, and thank you for joining me today. To kick things off, would you mind introducing yourself a little bit to our audience and talking about what your current job is about? Sure, I mean, I'm so pleased to be here and thank you so much for, for joining me today. Um, you are in Seychelles, I'm in Trinidad and Tobago, eight hours apart, you have been in school and, and classes all day, so thank you very much for taking the time. So as you say, my name is Kim Malaliu, I am a senior lecturer in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Engineering at the University of the West Indies here in Trinidad and Tobago. I'm also the Deputy Chair of the Telecommunications Authority in Trinidad and Tobago. So on the one hand is technology, on the other hand it's policy and regulation. I'm also the Vice Chair in the ITUD, development sector of the ITU network of women. So again, that's that's now a gender perspective on on my my what I do. <laughs> um, I am a mother of of three awesome boys, and uh, I'm happily married with two dogs, and uh, that's it really about me in a nutshell. So when and how did you get into technology? You know, in school as a young girl, I was more interested in science than the arts, perhaps because I could understand it easier and it came more naturally to me. I didn't have any, <clears throat> excuse me, natural ability or gifts in the arts. My handwriting was awful. My drawings were unattractive. And despite my crazy love for singing, which continues today, I really couldn't carry a tune. My dad was an engineer, so I, I grew up with this sort of psychology of a systematic approach to problems. It was a problem, you contemplated, you came up with a solution, you implemented the solution and it was done. So my, <clears throat> my whole sort of cultural family background um, was very much sort of science and technology um, ethos. I had no grooming for a career. My parents struggled with many personal matters and they had little time left to provide guidance, but they had both gone to university. And so it was natural, I guess, for everybody that I would go to university. I did. I went to university in the US from my home, which is what the time was a very small island in the Caribbean, St. Kitts. Um, 68 square miles, about 35,000 people there living at the time. I plan to study physics and uh, I'm also, I plan to see a bit of, of the wider world, bigger than the 68 square miles of beautiful island. Um, when I got there to, to MIT in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the US, I was blown away by, by just everything. Everything blew me away. <laughs> I was very starry eyed. Um, perhaps the most riveting of, of my experiences at MIT was, um, was an optics lab. A friend of mine who was a senior, that is to say, a, a final year student in the time. He was studying the, in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and he invited me to his lab one evening. This is during a party on campus. And he took off the lights, he turned on the lasers, and it was the most spectacular sight I've ever seen. You know, the laser light, um, going through making its way through beam splitters and lenses and mirrors it was just it, it was just beautiful so at the end of my first year beginning of my second year when i had to declare my major 
I declared it as electrical and computer and well, electrical engineering and computer science. Um, I, I didn't at the time know very much about it at all. I didn't understand really what the discipline was about. I just knew that the, the things, the little, a few things I'd been exposed to um, were interesting and, and I didn't think further than that. Okay, that's wonderful. So what was your path from then to now? Well, I, I studied in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. I focus in the area of optics in my bachelor's degree. And then I went on to do a master's in optics at the Institute of Optics. And then my doctorate, my PhD at the University College London in electrical um, and computer engineering, but again, focusing on optics. I was offered a job a research um, and development job in the US at a spectacular company, optics company, Adaptive Optics in the US. And the plan was that I would go back to take up this job in the US, but I said I'd just come home for one year. And so I got a job at university for just for one year with the intention of just getting that out of my system, you know, being home out of my system and to start my life, my adult life back in the US in Massachusetts. But that year when I came back, um, I actually loved it. So I, I stayed at the University of the West Indies, um, lecturing there, teaching. And I've been there ever since. That was, I don't know, something like 37 years ago. Um, when I was asked to, to lead the communication systems group in the department, I reached out to the Caribbean region to find out well, what did they want in the curriculum for a communication systems master's program. And the industry came back and they said, policy and regulation. And, and I said, well, I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about technically, because I had no expertise or real understanding about policy or regulation and even what its relationship with, was to technology. But they said, no, we, that the, the pressing priority now is policy and regulation. So I contemplated for a while, I fussed a lot, and then I said, okay, you know, um, we're gonna do it. So I designed and uh, co-delivered with a number of, of superb colleagues around the world, experts around the world, and we delivered a program, master's program in telecommunications regulation and policy. At that time, you see, Amina, the telecommunications industry was transitioning from one of a monopoly ownership where a single company um, in countries would have a monopoly on the provision of telecommunications services. That transition was to a liberalized market where multiple companies would offer services. When, when a monopoly is broken, when there are many uh, service providers offering services, there are a number of benefits that accrue to end users and subscribers. <clears throat> so I got to understand that um, there was no similar offering around the world. So we delivered our program um, online um, to 30 developing countries around the world. And uh, um, participants who are executives and senior managers in the telecommunications sector um, would come to the Caribbean, a different Caribbean island each year for a three-day face-to-face um, workshop. So there was this online component where you can be in your job because all of the participants were, as I say, executives and senior managers in their jobs, but they would come to the Caribbean for a face-to-face -face every year. And um, that was a, a, a pivotal um, turning point in my life where I got to understand that you could have expertise in the area of technology in my in my area my my case it was um electrical and computer engineering with a, 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 an interest in telecommunications which was the closest thing we could get to optics at the time and um, at the same time interact with multiple sectors to ultimately be of better service to, to the world to your country to your organization to your to, your, your, to people um, and so that really was the path from starting off, you know, at MIT as a young, um, a young engineering student, not understanding at all 
where I was going and, and at the time having no plans at all about how my life would unfold professionally or, or even personally. So that's been my path and um, there's been no looking back since. So what's your job in tech now? I now live in Trinidad and Tobago, which is uh, significantly larger than St. Kitts. St. Kitts, remember, was 68 square miles, 35,000 people. Um, Trinidad and Tobago was a twin island um, state, country, and there, the, our population is about 1.3 million. 1.3 million for the population of an entire country is small. And there are many priorities that, um, that require expertise to serve a community of 1.3 million people. So when you ask me what my job in tech is now, I would say it's many fold because in a country, a small country, particularly small island developing states, in, in these types of circumstances, many people are called upon to carry multiple roles. So when you ask me what my job in tech is, now I'd say it's manifold. Uh, my, my day job, as they say, um, is as a lecturer in telecommunications. I lead the communication systems group in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the university. But I also chair the campus ICT steering committee. So there's um, in, my, in the department, I teach and I lead the group and I supervise projects and uh, I also lead um, action research teams uh, that utilize um, technology to solve problems in, in, in our community, organizationally, nationally, regionally, internationally. But I also, as I mentioned, um, I, a very big part of who I am is my commitment, I guess, and involvement, engagement, and contribution as a, the deputy chair of the Telecommunications Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. So that brings in, as I mentioned, the policy and regulation aspect. Um, and then I, I hold a number of other, other portfolios in, across multiple disciplines. What do you like about your job or technology? Oh, well, I think, um, I think I pretty much like everything about my job. A couple of things maybe I could think of that I don't so much like. <laughs> but um, most, most everything I love about my job, but perhaps most of all, um, what I love about the, the job and, and technology is the interconnections and intersections between technology and the many disciplines and sectors that make living more enjoyable and rewarding. Of course, not all of technology makes living either more enjoyable or more rewarding, but that also adds a, a challenge which of itself brings reward in the area of technology where we fight as foot soldiers in armies of different types of foot soldiers around the world across multiple sectors to fight against the negative aspects of technology and, uh, and also the inequities that we see across access to technology. So those are the things I like is, is the interconnections and intersections between technology and all of the other sectors and disciplines that together make for a, a better world. Then can you share an example or two of things you have done in or with tech that you are particularly proud of? Yes, if I had to answer the question about prouder, being prouder, I guess a lot of the work I've done has spanned from um, engagement with ministers at the highest level of policy making through the techno all through the technology ranks, sort of longitudinally and laterally, and uh, um, the, th the full cycle to users, end users of technology who barely literate and in some cases not literate at all when i say literate i don't mean digital literacy i just mean basic literacy and so i guess what i'm most proud of is the interventions that my action research have made to impact 
the entire cycle from policy to technology to practice to actually touching the lives of small scale fishers who are very highly exposed to natural and man-made disasters in small undecked vessels out at sea outside normally traditionally outside of the reach of telecommunications service without the means to afford satellite service out at sea. So we have enabled these small scale fishers in many countries around the world who largely feel excluded from the buzz of the technological world. We've enabled them to use ICT information and communications technology and in particular cellular phones and marine band VHF radios, handheld radios to improve their lives and livelihoods. And, and to do so in a way that is on their terms, um, that is comfortable for them in, in ways that they can build their own competencies without feeling um, insecure um, in themselves. We've done that in a number of ways. One of the ways we've, we've done it is to work very closely with stewards. Stewards are people who are trusted within a community of small scale fishers and to build the competence of stewards to provide support to small scale fishers when and as needed so that we do not impose on communities like this the expectations of sitting in a classroom which is rigid and learning in very traditional ways but more so bringing the learnings to them on their terms through channels stewards who are trusted by them and live within the community so i think that if if i had to say what has made me most proud is that whole cycle of intervention that ultimately has um, made an impact you know um, at at the level of a very traditionally marginalized and underserved community that's good so uh, what's a lesson that you learned along the way that you'd like to share? So there are many lessons. So, but you asked me for one. <laughs> okay. I would say the lesson I've learned is that there is magic in community. When I was growing up in a very traditional environment, a very traditional West Indian environment, developing country environment, I and in a competitive school system sort of, of intrinsically grew up thinking that life was a, an individual journey what i've got to understand through my my career and through the journey in my career over very many years is that the magic is in community that the magic is in listening to not hearing listening to and learning from others in all stages and areas, at all levels, longitudinally, vertically, laterally. Um, the magic is in, in this community. It's in sharing with all who may benefit from our own experience, our expertise, our excitement, um, building on and working with others who share common objectives or goals, you know, facing and working through struggles together rejoicing in the big and the small victories and you know all of these that bring us closer to our targets okay so have you encountered any challenges along the way and if so how did you overcome them i'm sure that i have um but people are different and to be honest um just sitting here right now at this moment no challenges come to mind at the moment i, I think that generally i've simply seen a challenge as a, a directional guide you know a, a challenge is something that you solve so it provides you a direction of, of what you need to do you need to solve the problem so i i guess i think of of challenges as directional guides if a challenge is presented it calls for a solution and i dig deep until i i, I find one um, i guess the biggest challenge in my life um, would be the balancing as a woman balancing of, of my babies and my and my work and then the balancing of my young children and my work and now that my children are grown it's a balancing of dog training i am a schutzen handler 
um, so before I met you this morning, for example, I was, was on the field early morning before the sun went up, you know, um, doing some shoots and training. When, when my babies were babies, um, I breastfed, I breastfed them for, for, for a very long time. And in those days, you know, breastfeeding was something that you kept in the privacy of your own home, you know? And so I, I had a, a, you know, real sort of logistical drama to be able to work, you know, come to, to lecture and then dart home to breastfeed and then come back to, for meetings and, and all of these things. But, you know, I, I came up with solutions when, the, when my children were, were young, um, they were very avid swimmers. My two older boys were very avid swimmers. So it was working my schedule in a way that I could pick them up from school during working hours um, and then um, carry them to the pool where I would set up shop with my laptop and my, um, and, and my service on my phone, my internet service on my phone. Because of course, at that time, the pool didn't have Wi-Fi. So I could continue working while they swam um, for two hours. You know, things like that. Um, with, with the dog training, it's a similar sort of, of arrangement now. So that's been my biggest challenge. But you know, I mean, solving it, I think was, was good for me. Um, it was good for the children and the dogs. And, um, and I think it worked out. So since this series is about girls and women in technology, do you have any career or tech advice for girls and young women in tech? Everybody has their own different perspective on life. Um, my perspective is I'd say, don't think of your career as one in tech. Think of it as simply yours, doing you, what you love, what you're good at and how you can do good for others in the world while enjoying your friends, your family, and the beautiful world we live in. Do you, that's what I say is my advice, do you. If it is that, that your talents, unlike mine, lie in singing, you know, or art, or music, you know, or fashion, or poetry, all of these beautiful things that are so essential, I think, for an enriching life. If that's what, who you are, then do you and understand that you can do you even better with tech, you know? So I wouldn't, for me personally, I wouldn't focus on tech as a career. I would focus on doing you in any career that is fulfilling and enriching to you, recognizing that you could do it better with tech. That was inspiring, what you said uh, just now. So my final question is, do you have a role model you respect and why? There are many people I admire, of course. We all, we all have many people I admire. If you, if you ask me this today, I would say um, that my role model is a woman, an awesome woman named Bernadette Lewis. She's a Trinidadian. She's currently is the um, secretary general for the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization. Previously, she was the Secretary, Secretary General for the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. Bernadette represents, um, she embodies, uh, Bernadette embodies many of the, the characteristics that I believe are the most honorable, <laughs> if, I, if, I can, if it's okay for me to say that. One thing, I mean, one of the obvious things, there's so many obvious things about her, but one of the obvious things is that she is um, highly competent. She's an engineer with decades of experience leading teams. Another characteristic feature of Bernadette is her commitment. And it's obvious, it's clear. It, you can see it in every fiber of her being, commitment. Her commitment to the organization, whichever organization she works for. Um, and in the context with the, an acute awareness of the relevance to the context at the national level, the regional level, the international level, all with a developmental focus. Um, her strength of character, I love her strength of character, undistracted and undeterred by peer, political, and other pressures. Pressures, and there are many. When you lead an organization like that, there are many um, pressures very many of them are political, 
not necessarily governmental political, but all kinds of politics. And she has stood a steady um, path, you know, and continues to, and I have no doubt at all that she will always continue to. I love her, I respect her very highly, and perhaps the most endearing quality of Bernadette is her grace and kindness. She has a genuine care for and sensitivity to all persons and their needs, and it is evident. So it is not like um, strong and, uh, um, and inflexible, not at all. Strong in character, strong in conviction, but very, very um, gracious, uh, you know, and gentle. And that is, that, that would be the set of characteristics that I most revere, and they all reside in this, in this person, in the form of Bernadette Lewis. Shout out, Bernadette. So, Amina, before we close, can I ask you a couple of questions? Yes, of course. So, um, I'm so excited that you are studying technology and you're doing so in, you know, very, very far away from where I am in the Seychelles. You're in the Seychelles, I'm in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so how about you? When did you get into technology? I was always interested in technology, but it's only recently that I decided that this, uh, it was, that I want a career in tech. Okay, and what are your plans for participating in tech then? I plan on furthering my studies. I just started my first year in diploma in computing and IT. Uh, yeah, you know, it could go in any, any manner of directions, but, um, but please do you, you know, please find the magic for you. There is so much of it. I really, I wish you the best. I would love for us to keep in touch. If you ever need anything that I can help with, please reach out to me um, for a listening ear or a, a talking mouth. Um, I wish you all the very, very best. And I'm so proud of you that you participate you. in this week. And I know it's very late. It's very late and you have a bus to catch and the last bus is at 7 p.m. in the Seychelles, the last bus home. Thank you so very much, Amina. Thank you. I will keep your words in mind your advice so this wraps up our session today for talking tech women and girls in ICT thank you so much Dr. Kim Malaliu I really enjoyed our chat today and thank you to our viewers for watching